Watson Public Limited Company and Chief Executive of Capital Science and Policy Practice. Um, also at Willis Tower Watson. We have Professor Wadid Arian, Professor of Soil Science at Cairo University, Senior Advisor for Sustainable Development and Program Coordinator of the League of Arab States Climate Nexus Initiative. We have Michael Roberts, the head of the Aid for Trade Unit in the Development Division of the World Trade Organization. We have Alexander Kastrin, Senior Advisor for Trade for Sustainable Development, Sustainable and Inclusive Value Chain Section at ITC. And last but certainly not least, we have Lorenza Yakia, uh, UNSCE Focal Point for Disaster Risk Reduction and Secretary to the Working Party on Regulatory Cooperation and Standardization Policies. So, um, this part, we will um, be a further interactive, so I will just start with Rowan, as he's sitting next to me, and reflecting that the insurance industry has for a long time been kind of our main answer when it came to disasters. Now, to quote one of the leaders of your industry, this is changing. He said, the insurance industry's role as society's risk manager is under threat. Our sector will struggle to reduce the protection gap if our response is limited to avoiding rather than managing society's exposure to climate risk. Now, Rowan, may I put the question to you, what can the industry do and what is it already doing to support disaster risk reduction for enhanced resilience? Sure, thank you. I've just seen this incredible gavel that you've got here. Are you, gonna, you can use that after three minutes. Uh, it's, uh, it's lovely to be back. Um, I, I think I was invited for two reasons. One, I was lucky enough to chair the uh, private sector sort of committee that uh, fed into the Sendai framework uh, back in 2015. And as Irina mentioned, I have uh, a role in the world of reinsurance, which um, basically pays most of the bills of the 30% of economic losses which are uh, insured. And... Um, I sort of agree with uh, my industry colleagues' um, uh, co comments, but I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just give what I think the industry c can best do. So um, when I entered the industry in 92, Hurricane Andrew just smashed into the US, and uh, it was the kind of the final punctuation mark uh, on the industry at that moment. It was our crisis. And um, last year, we had the worst loss uh, year in history, didn't we, um, around the world? Um, particularly in uh, the Caribbean and North America. Worst insured losses in history, worse than any time before. But the one headline you probably haven't read is that uh, insurance companies are going bust or reinsurance companies are going bust or there's a lack of capacity or all these things. And it's because uh, 25 years ago or so, quarter of a century or so ago, our industry took a very bitter pill. It decided it had to encode risk into capital, encode climate and disaster risk into credit risk. So not hoping that next year would be okay, but working out with the help of scientists, as we've just heard, but also engineers and others, what could happen at a reasonable return period, one in 50, one in 100, one in 200 years. Our regulators require us to be resilient to the worst that can happen in one in 200 years. And what's happened is that uh, over that time, we have encoded climate and natural hazard risk into everything we do. And it's become incredibly resilient as a sector. Uh, the most fundamental thing we can do in the next year as a sector, and the reason we work so much with the ISDR over the years as a sector, is that they're the only uh, UN agency who understand and describe risk in the way it has to be described. No one else does. So we've supported much of that work. Lots of other UN agencies provide key input, WMO and others, but risk is a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. I implore you to look at the GAR report of 2016. Incredible piece of work. So what can we do? Well, here's the brutal truth. When it comes to climate, no one cares about resilience and adaptation up until now. It's just been about energy and mitigation. When it comes to Financial regulation and some emerging trends here, task force financial disclosures, absolutely no one cares about physical climate risk. They don't care. Basically, it's just used as a kind of a 
pictures like we've just seen to implore people to reduce carbon emissions. Important though that is, but basically physical climate risk is, has not been seen as a key part of that jigsaw puzzle. The final element is that in terms of law and duties of care, um, that is now moving to a fact that because these risks are foreseeable, duties of care we all have as employers, as cities, as mayors, as, uh, as, as public sector entities are now becoming tractable because these risks are entirely foreseeable. So what can we do between now and September next year when we have the climate summit in New York and actually adaptation and resilience and physical climate risk and duties of care will be on the agenda. Absolutely fa fabulous that UNCTAD and ISDR have teamed up because I can't think of any other agencies who are really going to drive this forward with the help of many others. But I think what the insurance sector can do is with these agencies take the lessons that we have bitterly had to learn over 25 years of how to encode these risks into the very core of finance and capital and legal duties of care. Picking up on some of the points that Paolo has made, thrilled to see Regina's uh, 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 gra graphics because what the work you're doing is exactly the sort of language that we can use. Uh, and, and using the, you know, the examples in Jamaica and all the rest of it. Um, so, uh, in, in essence, um, the brutal, other brutal truth is everyone uses these big numbers as a percentage of GDP globally. These numbers are still tiny. They're big if you live in, in, in the wrong SID, unfortunately, but m from a macroeconomic point of view, they don't yet count. So what we have to do is find additional ways of making this count economically. And I think if we can use some of the work that's been done in the insurance sector and show how this is critical to the future of city finance, and as uh, I think Paolo, uh, as Paolo said, public sector entities will reduce from providing protection. We're seeing it in America, let alone in other parts of the world. So huge amount to do, but I think between now and September next year, building on this uh, groundbreaking event today, uh, we could actually make uh, incredible progress. Thank you. Just three minutes. Thank you, Rowan. Yes, exactly three minutes. So, no, um, we don't have to ask <laughs> another question. That's it. <laughs> As yet. No more we questions. We will come back to you for sure. You Thank you for to. these insights. Um, to give us an overview of who's at the panel, I will pass straight away to Wadid, who has, is actually, so to speak, fresh off the press, <laughs> um, coming from the Arab Africa Regional Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, which closed on Saturday. Um, obviously, both of these regions um, face huge challenges and threats, not just from natural hazards and risks, but also environmental degra degradation, unplanned urbanization, demography changes, migration, and then instability questions. So, Wadid, would you like to give us a short overview of uh, the discussions last week. In yes. Yes, first of all, uh, they are all committed to understand the relationship between uh, SDGs, climate agreement, and uh, Sendai framework. They are all committed uh, to go on, on uh, moving uh, with Sendai framework from uh, crisis management to more risk management, but they are all committed to build the resilience better, and they are all committed to work uh, to uh, un better understanding uh, for how to make the fragile com communities more uh, better resilience, especially when talking about 70% of uh, the continent is under using, it's just people working with agriculture, and of course they are more affected with drought, with floods, with, with dust storms. They are all committed uh, to um, uh, work for Sandai, although they know that they have limited resources, but they have to reorganize their governmental uh, economic system, uh, working better with all financial organization internally to, to be more ready to act uh, to support more, uh, again, the private sector to act better in, uh, in Africa, uh, they need to build better infrastructure, housing, they have need to, to have more technology with their indigenous knowledge uh, to use together. 
So they are really uh, committed to do all this, but they still need uh, the support uh, from uh, all developed countries. They still need the technology. They still need capacity building. They are looking for better uh, sustainable finance. They understand that we are a new era after 2015 concerning uh, the way to get their finance, but they are also with a full understanding that they have resp their responsibility on this, but they need to learn better how to organize their capacities uh, on having better sustainable finance conditions. So this is uh, the message they are transferring to everyone. They are ready. They are committed, but they would like to have better knowledge to act. Thank you, Adid. Now doing a bit of another jump um, and going to the global trade system. So, um, Michael, I know that WTO is currently undertaking research that is looking at the issue of disaster, or shall I say disaster risk reduction in trade. Now, can you give us a bit of an update of how this work is progressing and um, what other, what, what maybe the first results might be. Thanks very much, Irina, and uh, thanks for the invitation to address you today. Um, I think what, I, what I'll do is try and pick up on some of the comments that have already been made as well in that context. Um, really, I think the work has, um, was stimulated by, was catalyzed by the presentation that Stephen made about looking at the, the impacts um, in the Eastern Caribbean. Obviously, last year being, um, as, um, as uh, Ryan just mentioned, the worst year in terms of disaster losses. Um, and so this work that the WTO has been doing is really trying to sort of capture the trade effects from three dimensions, I suppose, which is um, looking at the, well, four dimensions, looking at the sort of the trade effects, looking at then at trade measures that arise in disaster response, disaster recovery, and resilience more generally, of which we've heard a number of examples today. Um, so perhaps let me just try and sort of limit um, those, which is obviously a huge domain to, to cover. So let me just try and limit um, some of the, um, and limit the comments and try and pick up some of the themes that have already been made. Um, Professor Garona made, the, made this point about Brexit. Um, so if you look at some of the research that uh, is, has, been, has been undertaken in the car industry in the UK, one of the things that you see is just how incredibly efficient those global production networks are. So you see components moving within, or within the European Union, but also moving outside, moving across borders two or three times before they actually go into a car. And about more than 40% of the, the components are actually coming from outside of the UK. So you can see just how efficient those global production networks, and it's not just in the UK, it's a global phenomenon. But that efficiency and the transport and logistics that Regina has talked about as underpinning all of that also makes those global production networks, those global value chains, highly susceptible to exogenous effects. And Irina, you already you produced some, some, um, quite some statistics there in terms of how um, multinational companies are still perhaps turning something of a blind eye to that. Picking up on, on Rowan's point, it also, I think, depends on where you are in the global value chain in terms of what the impact is. So there, the point that you made in that if you're living in a small island developing state, you're going to see the impacts. It's going to affect your daily life. That's, very, that's I think, a very strong point that comes out of our work. Um, and also this point that the losses at this stage, in terms of global, global trade flows, they tend to be short-lived. So to give you an example there, um, I think the, the, um, some of the research that's uh, with the Thai floods and the impact there on global production networks, particularly within the car industry, that's very well known. What's perhaps less known is the impact that storms can have on tourism value chains, which can be extremely complex value chains. Um, Stephen was alluding to this the, um, in, his, in his comments, but one point which I think is important to think, I mean, we're obviously we're sitting here in a sunny day in October, or obviously, as Professor Garona th was mentioning, thinking ahead to when the cloud comes down in February, you know, a lot of us will want to get out, will want to go to other destinations. If there is, and, you know, we may have a holiday book to the Caribbean, um, if there is a hurricane that hits in that destination, 
our tour operator will rebook us somewhere else. So that transaction will still take place, but it will be to another destination. So there are very important trade diversion effects as well as trade destruction effects. And those I don't think have been, have been really kind of captured in the literature thus far. Then turning to the resilience dimension, which I think is the, is the sort of the hardest point of, um, for us to be trying to integrate. You can see how this, in, this um, overlaps with the multilateral trading system in a number of different ways with respect to um, various of our agreements and the approaches there. I guess within the, 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 the sort of the multilateral trading system at the moment, the approach is very much recognizing the right of, um, of members to take measures to mitigate risks, but also ensuring that those don't, don't end up in arbitrary or unjustified um, restrictions on trade. So um, that work is, is progressing, and um, we hope to have a second symposium to, um, towards the end of this year, and then a sort of a wrap-up conference which will present um, the results of this Australian-funded research in the first quarter of next year. So we look forward to working with you and other members of this panel to, uh, to get those results out there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, just moving on. Um, now we've heard about a lot about large multinational corporations and the big financial system. Um, I would like to draw back to what the DED of the ITC mentioned this morning that actually 90% of the economy in most countries exist because of small and medium enterprises. So Alex, could you give us a bit of an overview what are the main climate and disaster risks that the main stakeholders of ITC, which is the micro, small and medium enterprises, are facing and um, what ITC is doing to support them? Thank you, Rena, very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so, as you mentioned, uh, ITC's main business is working directly with uh, small and medium enterprises, providing capacity building to enable SMEs to export uh, more competitively. And in the recent years, climate change has become an, uh, an increasing focus of our work in terms of building resilience at the same time as building competitiveness. We see the two is going together. And during the course of that work, we've got an understanding of the type of risks that uh, SMEs are facing with respect to climate change and disaster resilience. And I, can, I think we've already heard a number of these from Stephen and Regina in terms of particularly such supply chain impacts, but also ability to access finance. But I could just share with you some insights uh, on the supply chain side in particular. Um, so most of our work is in agriculture, I would say, agricultural value chains, which of course is particularly exposed to uh, climate change and disaster risks. Um, two pieces of work which have informed us particularly a 2015 survey in Peru and Uganda of, of climate change risks um, of agricultural exporters of SMEs, but also more recently a work funded by a GIZ, a climate resilience uh, project. Um, so, I mean, essentially, uh, in the supply chain, ag um, SMEs are facing um, disruptions to their, their supply chain in terms of heavy rains. Um, so, a quote from the 2015 survey, I think, will bring to, light, bring to life that type of um, challenge. So, a coffee exporter from Pura in the north of Peru highlighted what this uh, means for business competitiveness when he said, when roads are interrupted, it delays the delivery process and it is not possible to meet orders on time. So carriers also rate, raise their rates. And so this has a sort of uh, domino effect along the supply chain um, for, for everyone involved. Um, and in terms of uh, there another impact is reduced yields. Um, so one of the exporters is telling us a coffee cooperative in Peru this has had an impact on uh, pests and diseases, so a rust outbreak has affected our livelihoods. Climate change will definitely have a strong effect because of the harm it will do to crops. Um, a similar story from Cusco, um, where a coffee exporter says production will be lower until coffee plants adapt to new climates, which takes a long time, which is a stark picture of uh, the ability of small and medium enterprises and their farmers to adapt to climate change. 
And then there are other impacts like water stress. The project in Morocco, the Climate Resilience Project, is uh, found in particular this has had an impact on higher water prices for textile processes. Um, changes in seasonality, which means you, it makes planning very difficult for uh, exporters, and so forth. So in terms of what um, small and medium enterprises need in terms of um, a way out of this to um, identify and, and, and mitigate these risks, um, there's a need for access for information and training on identifying and mitigating these risks, so a role for capacity building there. Um, improved knowledge on climate resilient agriculture, uh, improved access to finance and financial literacy for SMEs. So SMEs particularly only have a couple of staff who are juggling many different um, uh, operations at once. And so to take on a new set of expertise is a, is a, is a big challenge. And then I think an important uh, outcome from the GIZ Climate Resilience Project is um, to, to help SMEs to create a business case um, for uh, adaptation and um, a d direct linkage to um, finance, financing opportunities. Uh, financing options. And finally, I think there's been um, a lot of mention so far about um, partnerships and um, the role of the private sector to find a way to improve partnerships uh, with buyers and with banks um, to enable uh, improve the financing options. Thank you. And um, now moving to Lorenza. Lorenzo, you're doing a lot of work on um, standards, which can be a, a very valid complementary tool to standard regulation. Now, would you like to please update us on um, how consensus standards can help reduce losses from disasters, including to zero in on public admin administrations and regulatory agencies, and how these authorities use standards in the context of DRR? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the organizers for this um, uh, groundbreaking event and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, of course, today this event is organized to mark the International Day for Disaster Reduction. I also would like to mention that uh, just yesterday was also <coughs> World Standards Day. On 14 October, uh, we celebrate World Standards Day. And standards really help us build the fabric of, uh, of, of our economic model, and of course they help uh, make this economic model resilient in a number of ways. Uh, UNEC as an organization has been working together with the UNISDR on many different uh, other aspects of uh, resilience, and uh, I'd like to, before getting into the subject of standards, just uh, at least quote a few of those. Uh, the Water Convention has been uh, doing incredibly important work with riparian parties uh, to help them cooperate in uh, uh, preventing and managing uh, uh, water-related risks. The Accident uh, Convention, the Industrial Accident Convention, has also been doing extremely important work uh, regarding man-made uh, hazards. But uh, uh, today I'd like to focus really on how authorities can integrate standards in decision making and in making communities resilient. So we've been working on this priority for almost 10 years and uh, indeed risk management is extremely complex but we can take it to the level of uh, decision makers in a very simple way. And that's what we do when we uh, work uh, with uh, regulators from different industries, from different countries. We like to involve them and get them into uh, a meeting room and get them to work. And the first question we ask is, what is your objective in this uh, regulatory system? What is your objective in this industry? And the second question we ask is, so what are the risks that could jeopardize you achieving this objective? For example, you know, if you talk to the Ministry of, of Education, they will want to get kids in school. They will want to achieve universal education. But if a disaster strikes and the schools are shattered, that will not happen. And that brings disaster risk reduction into the fabric of everyday decision at all levels because it impacts the mission statement of an organization. It, in, it impacts on the stated achievement that it is built to, uh, to achieve. There are a number of voluntary consensus standards 
that authorities uh, use all over the world to reduce the risk of disasters. Let me just give you one example, the Common Alert Alerting Protocol, CAP, and International Standards for Emergency Alerting. That is a success story. 75% of the world's population lives in a nation with a CAP alert feed operational or under development. But a lot more needs to be done because we've seen the images of uh, so many disasters in which the alert systems were not working properly. But it's hard to imagine any system that has saved more lives than this one. And if I can conclude, uh, moving on to the actions that I think are, are uh, really key to, uh, to bring uh, disaster, uh, disaster risk reduction and standards into the uh, fabric of uh, regulatory decision making, I would like to mention uh, just four uh, priorities. First one is facilitating access to standards and, and uh, increasing awareness of standards. For example, the European Union has a uh, uh, funded um, database which is called Resistand and it is a website that is freely available and uh, it identifies all the different standards that exist and can be used in this context. Uh, the second is to involve uh, the standards community more closely into DRR and to involve uh, public sector and uh, public authorities in the making of the standards. Public authorities do not sufficiently participate in making the standards and then these standards are not fit for their use. And we as the United Nations also do not have the capacity to sufficiently integrate these, uh, these standards making community. Of course, uh, my colleague from ITC has mentioned uh, vocational training and training. Uh, that's also a priority that we have seen. And last, I think it is crucial that when we look at quality infrastructure, so all the infrastructure that is used to support standardization in terms of conformity assessment, in terms of accreditation, this quality infrastructure is not sufficiently geared to the priority of sustainable development. Uh, we gear quality infrastructure mainly to serve trade. And that's a valuable priority, but uh, it is also very important that we have the means to check whether a house is resilient to seismic risk that are prevalent in that area. And we, we need to have uh, sufficient capacity for that along with uh, quality infrastructure that's a trade. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you once again. Thank you. So, um, as mentioned before, we're really taking broad strokes um, through the overall topic of economic losses. So, um, I think the, the main message is that both public and private investment needs to be more risk informed. Um, now, how do we do this? We looked at the, the issue of resilient infrastructure, at the financial system, at the international trade system at risk management strategies in the private sector, role of insurance to incentivize, and uh, expectations from countries and public financing. So what I would like to do is now for, let's say, the next 10 minutes, give it back to you um, as our audience and as the trade and development community to give us some ideas and reflections, questions on what you've heard so far. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. My name is uh, Bernard Niembo. I came from the Kasai province in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I'm uh, in the public, uh, a private sector. We try to, to prevent disaster in the area of uh, clean water for uh, the villages, villagers, sorry for uh, the accent. But we are facing problems whenever we try to approach um, the international community in order to raise, um, to raise funds for uh, contributing to uh, our, our plants in the Kasai. So I don't know if uh, there may be other issues here to help us um, solve this, uh, this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Uganda.
One is with uh, respect to trade. Uh, I want uh, Roberts to probably to elaborate more because when disasters strike, usually sometimes you find even the market is destroyed. The, uh, the sellers or the buyers are even no more. So I wonder how one would use or would tackle such a situation, such a challenge, to you know, reduce, the, reduce the effect of the, of the disaster. Now, in the case of um, Douglas, uh, you know, this insurance is uh, something which is very difficult to understand its effect. One time I took what they call life insurance. But then, when there was a civil war in my country, later on uh, I looked at my papers of the insurance. They said, if I were to be, uh, were to be killed, uh, insurance would not pay me because that was a disaster, an act of God. So I don't know how insurance now come in in the present situation where we're having different various kind of instruction, doing a lot of destruction uh, in places like the recent one of the say of Michael in the Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you. Is there any other comment? Well, then I, I start maybe with um, Michael. Um, there was a question on um, how to apply the trade rules, maybe at the more local level, uh, to build resilience in the longer term. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ambassador Appa, for the, for the question. Um, I think it's a, it's a very important point you, you raise, it's the, and, it, and I think the results, the preliminary results that we're starting to get is it's not just the, the destruction, say, for example, of, of production. Um, the, the representative from the FAO was talking about the, the losses. So if you, if you, if you take a, a small island or a small economy from the Pacific um, at, a, at a low level of development, low level of income, there will be a lot of effort that's going into agricultural diversification. So out of traditional crops or commercialization, a formal commercialization of, of those crops and diversification into other crops like tree crops, for example. You have a cyclone that comes through. What happens, you lose not just the production, you also lose the pack houses. You lose, then most importantly, the commercial relationships. Um, which are just starting to evolve. You lose the standards compliance um, infrastructure. So it's not just the loss of production, it's also the loss of those commercial relationships that, that, that is the longer term impact here. Now, picking up on Ambassador Apar's comments, there are, I would, I would suggest, two dimensions to this. One is obviously the, the response from trading partners, both in terms of assistance, um, and also there's the response in, in terms of trading rules. So within the, the response in terms of um, the assistance that's provided, then um, clearly there's a role for aid for trade here in terms of building, rebuilding, um, and building in a, in a resilient way the trade, the trade capacity of, um, of disaster-affected countries. Um, and then there's also a role within the rules um, in terms of how it treats the question of development. And here there is, um, as Stephen was mentioning, a proposal that's, that has been tabled by the um, OECS um, at WTO. There's also consideration being given um, in New York um, by the Committee on Development Policy about how to treat the question of economic vulnerability within least developed, the least developed country category and graduation. Um, I think if you allow me to just make a, a general point, I would very much say that I think that open um, and rules-based markets are a, are a very key ingredient of resilience in the longer term. Um, Professor Gorona was talking about market integration. Now, I mean, obviously within the context of financial markets, I think that applies across the board. Um, so, and I think 
if you look at some of the turbulence that's currently going on in the, in the global economy, and um, if you take one product, steel, I mean, it's, it's a critical component of, of rebuilding and, and a critical component in housing. Um, and if you're thinking about building it in a resilient way, then you're going to be using steel. So if you start to see turbulence in global markets that are, is perhaps creating difficulties with the rules-based system and open markets, that's not a factor for resilience. That's going to work in the opposite direction. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Rowan, um, I would like to ask you to, to answer to the question how the insurance industry deals or might deal with this increasingly complicated relationship between natural disasters and conflict situations or civil unrest. Thank you. Um, the delegate from Uganda had um, obviously describing a very difficult situation. Um, it, it is certainly within the, the commercial insurance world, um, war and, and serious civil strife is often something that can't be insured in the usual market. Weather and climate risks absolutely can be. They're seen as being more independent. So um, you, you've raised uh, a, an important um, di dimension. Um, I think one interesting area where there really is, and, and the highlights the need for, for, for transparency and link between, if you like, public policy objectives and, uh, and the industry. I think there are some very interesting innovations, though, where governments and uh, the, the sector is coming together. And um, in Africa, I see uh, the African Union have come together uh, working uh, at sovereign state level uh, through a vehicle called the African Risk Capacity Initiative. I see a few nodding heads of people who are aware of this. We're actually using uh, advanced weather data and analytics to understand exactly when uh, rain will be required for certain crops. Um, countries are buying insurance such that when uh, rainfall, in usually the case, uh, is not sufficient at a particular time in a particular place, the government will receive payouts before the disaster occurs so that uh, intervening uh, measures can be made so that actually hopefully um, uh, communities locally don't suffer losses and can keep going to the next growing season. Uh, in, I, I see a few countries, so I can't see everyone, but in, in Mexico some very exciting work done over the last 20 years through, through Fonden, the protection of the government uh, from natural disasters. In Algeria some very significant work uh, in seismic risk. Now, uh, we, we have seen some, some limited work where international institutions are seeing, is it possible to find metrics which will allow communities or institutions to insure themselves against war or other, if I can call it like this, sort of extreme political risks. It's much more challenging because those risks are by their nature um, uh, it's not that they're unpredictable, it's just that the, often the, the entity that's uh, seeking insurance is, is directly, it's not an easy thing to, to model and, and sort of understand from an insurance point of view, but there is some work being done in this area, but I would say it is a particularly challenging one. Thank you. Now, is there more questions to our panelists? If not, what I would like to do is just pose one last big question to all of you. Um, we've heard a lot now about the public side and the private side, and I would like to hear from all of you your suggestions in your respective area of work, region, country, um, of how you think the public and the private sector could work better together but here also looking at, and it's been mentioned by some of the audience, how we then also need to bring in other stakeholders, because those actually have been quite absent from the discussions today, and I'm quite aware of it, the science side, but also the civil society and the vulnerable populations themselves. So I would like to hear from you how you think, what kind of options do we have to address this, and then as you are all experts in the area of trade and development, how we could best engage the trade and development community within this. 
So maybe I start this time from my left with Lorenza, and then we go through the row. Thank you. Uh, yes, in uh, taking the disaster risk reduction and the trade communities closer together, it is really crucial to uh, reflect more on uh, ways how uh, firms can become more resilient to disasters. And uh, in particular, when we think of standardization, there's numbers of standards like continuity standards, emergency management standards, that could be uh, brought quite, uh, quite usefully to, to uh, uh, make uh, also uh, communities resilient and uh, bring them out from uh, the trade arena out onto the communities and uh, the um, uh, cities that host uh, productive facilities. So include uh, the population that live alongside these facilities into the discussion on how to make uh, firms and productive uh, plants more, if, uh, more resilient to disasters. As regards uh, also the priority of uh, public and private working more closely together, I think uh, the regional dimension is very important. And uh, in particular, the peer learning among uh, policymakers that happens at regional level is a particularly important uh, uh, dimension. We've organized uh, an event just recently uh, that uh, brought uh, policymakers together with the uh, standardization organizations, and we've been uh, collecting success stories of how uh, countries and policymakers use standards, and uh, we've uh, witnessed uh, that uh, the conversation among policymakers uh, is particularly important. Uh, finally, before I close, I wanted to uh, uh, get into a topic we, we haven't mentioned uh, this morning, and it is quite relevant to disaster risk reduction, and it is the gender dimension. We've, uh, uh, we're all aware of uh, how uh, more deadly and devastating the uh, impact on disaster on women is, and we haven't done enough research as regards uh, the impact of economic losses on women entrepreneurs and women workers. I think that is a priority that we should uh, take up as we uh, reflect on, uh, on our priorities working together in this partnership going forward. I thank you. Thank you, Lorenza. Now I would like to pass the word to Michael. Okay. In, in essence, that's what the, the multilateral trading system is. It's, you, have, you have member governments that negotiate rules, but it's private companies that trade for the most part. So, in a sense, that is a public-private partnership already there. Um, a question is, of course, whether um, risk is sufficiently captured within those rules. That's a debate that our members can have, prompted by the private sector. Um, and those vulnerable communities are very much represented at the table. So you've heard the OECS discuss today. You've heard Uganda um, expressing its, its concerns. Those are um, a, number of, uh, a small number of a broader membership that's concerned by this, and not only just the disaster-affected states themselves, but I think also the, the integrity of the system. So there, there's obviously an important environment dimension to this, and I was hoping that you might ask me this question, so it gives me a bit of a chance to do a bit of a publicity for a publication that was just launched last week on making trade work for environment, prosperity, and resilience, and you'll find some interesting um, materials there in there. Um, I mean, these issues are captured within the, the, the multilateral trading system, within various agreements, for example, the ones that refer to standards. Can, is further work um, necessary and possible? Well, the answer can't be proposed by the Secretariat, unfortunately, it has to be proposed by the membership, but this is an important dialogue 
towards stimulating that debate. Um, final point, I think the devil is really in the detail here. Um, so if we, if we think about the insurance dimension um, to this, to give one example of a particular services, a particular category of services that's obviously hugely important in the, in the global economy, the ability of insurance companies to operate across borders is directly impacted by trade measures and trade rules. So if we are looking to bridge that financing gap, there has to be agreement on rules that facilitate that. And I think there's broad, I think there's a broad um, perspective in terms of the, the work on services at a multilateral level <coughs> that more can be done. Um, and obviously there's bilateral approaches and everything else that perhaps time we don't have uh, to get into. But I think if we're thinking about that market integration as being one of the answers, then there's clearly a lot of work that's still left to do. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Now, um, passing on to Alex for some complimentary okay. views. Just some final words. Thank you very much. Uh, so, well, firstly, thank you. It's been an excellent opportunity, I think, for uh, two communities of trade and disaster resilience broadly to, to, to come together and to uh, just find some common ground. And I think that I, really, I hope the message has been that there has been a there is a strong role for trade to make and uh, in improving disaster resilience. Um, and just to reiterate the point of my deputy executive director that, um, that we need to get the business environment right, I think, in terms of uh, building that uh, resilience, such as getting, we've heard a lot about having well-functioning markets, uh, the ease of doing business, improved governance and infrastructure. Uh, that would be a main policy message. And then uh, we shared with you how we're working at, at the SME level and our approach at ITC is to mainstream risk into our programming. Um, as well as developing uh, climate-specific um, toolkits to enable us to engage effectively with SMEs. And in answer to the particular question about public and private, I think our focus is uh, largely on the supply chain and how can we get uh, buyers to um, engage with small and medium enterprises to make their lives easier in terms of um, accessing finance, reducing transaction costs, as Stephen uh, mentioned, to, to, uh, to get access to finance for implementing climate adaptation strategies. So um, there are many, uh, we should be providing platforms, but that's just one example of uh, how we can work effectively. Thank you, Alex. Rowan, yeah. some words on the role of insurance. Uh, no, well, no, I don't want to talk just about it, uh, an insurance. I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, how can we practically take forward? Which has been a really interesting group of institutions, uh, obviously on the various panels and, and in the room, uh, as well as the countries. And uh, I think, um, as, as, was, as was just mentioned, the devil's in the detail. So um, how, how about this? Much of what we've been talking about is obviously around transportation and the dis logistics, so related to trade, uh, and economic development, and also so vulnerable potentially to, to climate and other uh, risks and shocks now, let alone uh, in the future. This is a clear and present challenge, let alone uh, looking ahead. And uh, I don't know so much about UNCTAD, but I do know a bit about the Sendai framework. And as, uh, as Irina said, there's some very hard-won hooks in this little loan agreement. And one of them is the following. I, I paraphrase, I'm just going to just highlight the key sentences. Businesses, professional associations, and pr private sector financial institutions, including financial regulators and accounting bodies, to integrate disaster risk management, including business continu continuity, into business models and practices through disaster risk-informed investments in the development, here we go, of normative frameworks and technical standards that incorporate disaster risk management. Code 4, set the standards, set the rules. So would it be exciting if by the very big climate summit that there will be uh, in 11 months' time in New York, where adaptation and resilience is finally going to get its moment in the sun, that we could develop a set of um, standards and procedures, uh, sorry, standards and disclosure requirements around ports and airports around the world to do with particularly climate risk? I know that there's... I know we could move into seismic and others, but this, I think it's absolutely tractable to create a set of uh, disclosure-based metrics in an economic sense of physical climate and potentially other natural hazard risks 
for uh, a broad section of the world's ports and airports. I know it's not everything, but it's an important start. But also to highlight what should be the duties of care, what should be the resilience requirements of these assets. Should an airport typically in a developing world country be resilient to the average loss expected once every 25 years, or once every 50, or once every 100? We don't know. No one's ever said what that should be. But I really think practically with potentially some of the countries here in the room that, uh, and the related industries, if we can't make a start on ports and airports and climate and natural disaster risk and trade, where else can we make a start? We've got 11 months. I think it's absolutely tractable to bring something forward in time for the Climate Summit in September 2019. And I move the motion. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Looking forward to the response of the community. I think this is a very interesting and exciting um, suggestion. Also, as um, may I just take the liberty to jump in here and highlight that in, in the 11 months towards the Climate Summit, we have in May 2019 here in Geneva the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, which brings together the disaster risk reduction community, but also the new communities, and even more exciting, the global platform has been officially um, accepted as one of the milestones of the UN Secretary General towards the Climate Summit. So this would give the community here an opportunity to sit together um, and hopefully by then already discuss further on the suggestion that has just been made. Now, for the final comments, I would like to pass the words to Wadid. Thank you. Uh, in fact, League of Arab States see uh, SDGs as an important opportunity. And uh, when I say uh, SDGs, I have in mind all the time the integration uh, and the, the interlinking between the different goals and targets as well, including SDG 13, which climate is the main uh, subject, and the targets including, of course, all the hazards and the disasters as well. But sustainable finance has been identified by uh, our Arab uh, committee, uh, high-level committee for sustainable development as one of the major priorities. And for that reason, we are preparing now, uh, after a long dialogue with our stakeholders that started uh, in Arab Sustainable Development Week, which we organize as a platform for our stakeholders to understand better their priorities in the region. So we decided to go in the coming uh, summit, economic summit in uh, January, and we are introducing a new initiative called Sustainable Finance Initiative. The idea is to support uh, countries uh, to, uh, first of all, as I was just telling in the beginning about the uh, needs of governments to understand better how they should uh, organize their financial resources. Second, how the public sector and the private sector should act together because any action needs the private sector to be engaged and banking, is, uh, private banking, banking and the insurance company should be involved in, on the process, as well as, uh, and we maybe sometimes forget about it, that uh, we have also uh, um, uh, what we call C CSR, and uh, they are also from the civil society, and they, are, they would like also to, to contribute in many of the activities. Uh, we have uh, in our committee a special group working for preparedness of all the initiative and all the activities, including uh, Ford Foundation um, from one side, the uh, UNEP Finance Initiative, including IFSC for World Bank, including uh, Union of Arab Banks, including uh, Islamic uh, Bank for Development. So they are working together with the League of Arab States to establish uh, what we call a mechanism for sustainable finance, and this mechanism is a round table. This round table is mainly from the central bank government, uh, governors, and as well as uh, countries, uh, finance uh, organization institutions. Uh, they, are, they're, they're, they are going to meet in regular way, and uh, they are going to, to help in the developing the policies that support uh, those type of um, activities on a region. And let me here maybe shift a little bit and say a region with 48% of countries affected by conflicts. 
and has instability, which is very unique to act also with countries affected and for post-crisis. And here I would like just to, to jump a little bit and say, even sustainable finance is needed on such countries and with complete understanding that agriculture sector should be one of our major targets uh, to post conflicts on such countries because we need the displaced people to come back to their uh, houses, to come back and find uh, better roads, uh, services, education, health, uh, electricity, roads, that they can come and settle again and they go back to their business. Knowing that in some countries like Syria, and I was one of the people who wrote in 2010, before the crisis in Syria, that Syria is going to instability because of two cycles of drought. And I, knowing this, we need also to build the resilience uh, even with this, within those communities and those uh, rural areas uh, for better resilience for facing droughts and also working and acting uh, in a better way. So we are working uh, to build uh, sustainable finance in the region. And uh, we have already established um, one of the uh, activities called the SDG Climate Nexus Facility with the UNDP, UNICDR, with the World Food Programme, with the UNIP Finance Initiative, and the Habitat, and the other uh, uh, regional, uh, Arab regional organizations. Idea here is to, to change the strategies, policies uh, related to all uh, that field, especially with come to multi-hazards, uh, to understand better the profile of the countries and states, and at the same time, how to act using sustainable finance as a major arm to develop and acting for building better resilience and going more for uh, crisis, uh, moving from crisis management to more risk management. Thank you. Thank you. Now, unbelievably, it's <laughs> one o'clock. <laughs> well done, Arena. Well done. So um, let me not keep you much longer, but I think we had um, very interesting uh, interventions from all the panelists, and I would like to take the opportunity again to thank you all for coming, for the big interest. I also would like to thank the audience for coming and uh, showcasing your interest, and I really hope that we can, as mentioned by several panelists, we can look into how to establish closer links between the disaster risk reduction and the trade and development communities. Um, the big word of the day of breaking down silo silos, I think is very valid for this topic. And uh, I think we got a, got a lot of ideas and opportunities that have been reflected in the discussions today. And so with this, I would like to thank you all again and close the discussion and invite you all for which I hope Outside is a bit of a refreshment for all of us waiting. Thank you.